Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So in my last video I discussed the new summoning spells in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and in this video I am going to be talking about the rest of the spells. If you missed the summoning spell video you'll see a link in the video description but that's why I'm not going over the summoning spells again. Now Tasha's Cauldron of Everything didn't have a whole lot of new spells but I will also discuss all the spells that were printed in the book. So let's get started. As usual with these videos, I am going to be ranking the spells. Red if I think it's a poor spell. Orange if I think it's overly circumstantial. Purple if I think it's a decent spell. Green if I think it's a good spell. And blue if I think it's fantastic. If you are colorblind, I also do a star rating. So you're going to see one star beside red, two stars beside orange, three stars beside purple, four stars beside green, and five stars beside blue. And in the timestamps for this video, I'm going to just write in what the ranking was. So we actually have five cantrips in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, but only one of them is a new cantrip. First, I want to briefly talk about Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade, because they each now have a couple little changes to them. They both now have a range of self. Instead of a five-foot range, that means we can no longer use things like Spell Sniper to give us an additional five-foot range on them. But I think in most cases we weren't using that, so that I don't think that really makes a difference. The other thing is we're going to now have a material component. That means we must have a melee weapon worth at least one silver piece. This could potentially affect things like using Shadow Blade with this, which, technically speaking, doesn't have a value at all. Though I think the main reason why this was added wasn't to nerf Shadow Blade. I think the reason why they did this was so that you couldn't use a component pouch to cast Booming Blade and then the spell description didn't make sense anymore. In general, Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade are still excellent cantrips if you want to be able to do melee damage. And I think the builds that used Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade before are still going to use them without any significant changes to 99% of those builds. So both Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade still really strong spells I think if you really want to specialize in melee and you don't have extra attack, you probably want both of them because they are usable in different situations. I will note that Green Flame Blade is depending on your casting ability score, while Booming Blade is not. So if you are dipping into a spell that would be based on an ability score that you're not particularly strong in, then Booming Blade is your better option. But if you have a strong casting stat, they're both really good spells, and I would rank them both green. That brings us to Lightning Lure. This again is a reprint and I didn't see any changes to this when I went over it. So the idea of Lightning Lure is you cast it on a foe within 15 feet and if they fail a strength saving throw they're pulled 10 feet towards you. If that brings them within 5 feet of you they also take damage which is lightning damage and it's a d8 and it scales at the usual cantrip levels. Now generally speaking I think that this is kind of the poor man's Thorn Whip. Thorn Whip is a druid spell and it has a 30 foot range and pulls a creature 10 feet towards you and it has the advantage that it does the damage regardless of the ending position of the creature. But Lightning Lure does have some advantages over Thorn Whip. The first is it only has a verbal component so that means we don't need a hand free and it means that we don't need the Warcaster feet in order to cast this with our hands full. So if we are playing a melee build, I could see Lightning Lure having some draw. Secondly, the damage is a little bit higher, though I would note that again, it is not automatic depending on where the creature ends, so I'm not sure that's an advantage. But the final thing, and this is the big one, that it is usable on creatures bigger than large. Now creatures bigger than large are probably going to have pretty good strength saves, so I wouldn't call this a particularly reliable spell on huge or gargantuan creatures, but at least you have that option. Overall though, again, I think Thorn Whip is the better spell of the two. Lightning Lure I think is okay for certain kinds of builds once in a while. That means I think it is overly circumstantial and I'm giving it an orange rating. That brings us to our only new cantrip, that's Mind Sliver. People love this cantrip. First off, it is going to provide an intelligence save 
and that's the save you want to target if you have your choice. A lot of creatures have negative intelligence modifiers and do not have proficiency in intelligence saves. Now the damage isn't great, it's d6 and it scales, but we also get the add-on that we're going to subtract a d4 from their next saving throw. Now I love subtractions from saving throws, but I think you should keep in mind that if this is going to be your damage cantrip, you're going to find that there's a lot of rounds where that d4 never comes up. I think Mind Sliver is one of those cantrips that you might want to have as kind of a side cantrip, so that when you are setting up somebody else for a spell and you don't want to use a spell slot, you can help them achieve their goal without using any of your resources. And in that respect, I think it's completely solid. But I think if it's just going to be your damage spell, round after round, although it is reasonably reliable, the damage isn't strong, and if you're not using that D4, there is effectively no rider. Range of 60 feet is pretty standard for the save spells, and I would expect to do significantly less damage with this than Toll the Dead overall, despite the fact more creatures are saving versus Toll the Dead. And so I think this is a green rank spell, just because I do think there is a use for it that you will absolutely be able to use, but I probably wouldn't make it my primary attack cantrip. But a spell I definitely wouldn't use as my primary attack cantrip is the last cantrip in Tasha's, and that Sword Burst, not a good cantrip. You cast it, creatures within 5 feet of you make a dexterity saving throw or take a d6 force damage, and of course that scales. So first off, not good damage. Secondly, this one has friendly fire. This is only really good if you are surrounded by creatures, and they should probably all be hostile creatures. And if you're looking for this kind of cantrip, I'd be looking maybe at the Superior Word of Radiance, which does not have Friendly Fire. And so overall, for me, Sword Burst is a red cantrip. Now there is only one new first level spell, and that is Tasha's Caustic Brew. So Tasha's Caustic Brew is available to Sorcerers, Wizards, and Artificers. It has a duration of one minute, and you are going to fire a stream of acid. It is 30 feet long, 5 feet wide, so it is a line spell. Each creature in the line gets a dexterity saving throw. If they succeed on that saving throw, nothing happens. If they fail on that saving throw, they are covered in acid. And nothing happens right away. But at the beginning of their turn, they're going to take 2d4 acid damage. And they will continue to take 2d4 acid damage as long as you concentrate. And as long as they don't take an action to wipe the acid off. So the potential advantage here is that we might take up an action of a creature for them to wipe it off. Though I'd point out that that creature can also get the acid off by breaking your concentration, which you can achieve by doing damage to you. And there are a few things here that I think really make this not work well. The first is the line effect. Now, I understand that as first level spells go, you don't really have any line spells, so this is the only one. But honestly, I don't think you need any line spells. Line spells are hard to place to hit several creatures. I think it's going to be very, very rare for you to hit more than two creatures with this. And if one of them saves, which I think you should pretty much count on, then we're talking about hitting one creature for 2d4 damage per round using your concentration. Now, at least you don't have to use your action to deliver that 2d4 damage around. So I do think this is better than Witch Bolt. But I'm seeing this advertised online as a way to take out a bunch of actions of creatures, and I don't think you're going to get that. I think at best, you're going to take out one action of one creature to get rid of this, and that's quite a bit to expend a spell slot on and use your concentration. Not that you're concentrating on anything else at level 1, so maybe as a level 1 spell and then trade it out later. But I just think when we want to do damage to enemies, we have better options at level 1. Just the good old Thunder Wave, I think, is better at level 1. And I think we will find that some creatures who take this damage are just going to deal with it by killing your concentration by doing damage to you. So I'm not convinced it's going to give us a lot of lost actions for creatures. Overall, I think this is orange, and I might be generous. That brings us to second level spells, and we'll begin with Tasha's Mind Whip. This is available just to sorcerers and wizards. I think as far as second level spells go, if you're looking for an offensive option that can also disable an enemy, I think Dash's Mind Whip is a strong option. First off, Intelligence Saving Throw. Again, this is the saving throw we want to hit if we can. 
90 foot is pretty good range, and a creature that fails takes 3d6 psychic damage. Psychic damage is reliable. 3d6 is low damage for a second level spell, especially against a single creature, but it's not irrelevant damage. But if we were looking for a spell to do damage at second level, Tasha's Mind Whip isn't our choice. But a creature that fails their save also on their next turn only gets a move, an action, or a bonus action. And it is unable to take reactions until the end of its next turn. So that's not a bad control because these kinds of controls often are using your concentration. Now we only have a duration of one round here, but the control aspect here is reasonably good. And then the damage is an add-on to that. So when we combine the damage with the effect, I think this is reasonably strong. Another thing I'd point out here is that if we are going to upcast a spell, the upcasting is reasonably good because we can target an additional creature for every spell level. So would I ever use a third level spell to hit two creatures with Tasha's Mind Whip? If I have third level spells available, no. I still think third level spells are so much better than second level spells. I'm almost certainly going to cast a third level spell. But if I have third level slots and I don't have any third level spells because I multiclassed, Tasha's Mind Whip is definitely something I'd consider upcasting. And I think Tasha's Mind Whip is something I would definitely consider as a second level spell if I'm looking for an offensive option. So I'd rank this solid green. That brings us into our third level spells. So our first third level spell I'm going to go over is Intellect Fortress. All our typical arcane spellcasters get access to this. Bards, sorcerers, warlocks, wizards, and artificers. This is concentration for one hour. You can cast this on yourself, you can cast it on an ally within 30 feet, and they're going to have resistance to psychic damage, as well as advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. Now we see the artwork here, and we can see that the spellcaster is using this against a mind flayer, but whoever is casting this spell in the artwork obviously upcast that spell, because don't expect to be protecting multiple creatures unless you upcast it, because you are doing one creature and one additional creature for every spell level you upcast it. And in general, I don't see preparing this spell, because I think it's a pretty niche use. And it is expensive. Third level or higher level spells, and it requires concentration, this is a huge investment for something that often is going to have no impact at all. But if I know I'm going against something that's going to do psychic damage, and I know that intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws are important, because we're going to be invading that Mind Flayer Fortress, and we're going to be facing Mind Flayers and Intellect Devourers and those kinds of things, Intellect Fortress could still be really useful, but only in those cases. So I think it's overly circumstantial, and I'm giving it orange. So the second third level spell I'm going to go over is Spirit Shroud, or as I would refer to it, Divine Favor Done Right. Because that's really what Spirit Shroud is, is it is a more powerful version of Divine Favor, and I think it is enough more powerful that it is actually a decent spell. This is a pretty high level spell, especially if you're something like a Paladin. Now this is also available to Clerics, Warlocks, and Wizards. It is a bonus action spell. And until the spell ends, any attack you make deals a d8 extra damage when you hit a creature within 10 feet of you. You get to pick the damage type. It could be Radiant, Necrotic, or Cold. Why you would choose Cold? Radiant is pretty much always your best option there. And any creature that takes that damage can't regain hit points until the start of your next turn. That is a fairly small benefit. There are definitely creatures with a regeneration. There are definitely creatures with healing powers but most creatures don't have those. In addition, any creature of your choice that you can see that starts its turn within 10 feet of you has its speed reduced by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. That's again a fairly minor effect, but it's occasionally okay. So this is going to affect any attack you make. So this might be attacks you make with a sword, might be attacks you make with a bow, might be attacks you make with an Eldritch Blast, but you do have to get in close. You have to get in within 10 feet and it scales with level. You can cast a 5th level version of this to get 2d8 per attack. You can do a 7th level version of this to get 3d8 per attack. So if you are something like a Warlock that could potentially get several attacks using Eldritch Blast, this could be a lot of damage. 
And that's really the key here. I don't think this spell is worth it for anyone who's attacking once per round. You need to be attacking multiple times around for this to be useful. Think about it this way. If you're a paladin and you hit with an attack and you just use a smite spell with the third level slot, you're getting 48 damage for that. You would need to hit with four attacks for this just to break even and it's using your concentration. So you really need to be hitting with more than four attacks with this for it to be worthwhile. But there are ways in this game to get many, many attacks in a round. I mean, just a fifth level Gloomstalker Ranger with two levels of fighter using action surge can get six attacks on round one of a combat. And that's not using their bonus action. So I think if we carefully look at how we build characters, Spirit Shroud is now a viable option for certain builds. But it's not for every build. But I do think it is a good option for enough builds that I think a solid purple ranking is appropriate. And that brings us all the way to 6th level, where we look at Tasha's Otherworldly Guys. This is available for Sorcerers, Warlocks, and Wizards. This is Concentration 1 Minute, and it's a bonus action spell. Not a lot of bonus action spells at 6th level. When you cast a spell, you're going to choose one of two options, Upper Planes or Lower Planes. If we get Lower Planes, we're going to get immunity to fire and poison damage and immune to the poison condition. Thing is, not a lot of things give you immunity to fire or poison. With lower level spells, there's really no way to get immunity. Fire Shield gives you resistance, Absorb Elements gives you resistance, Protection from Poison gives you resistance, Protection from Energy gives you resistance. In order to get immunity, we got to get into the higher level spells. And there is a 6th level spell that can give you immunity to Fire, Investiture of Flames, which isn't a very good spell. It requires an action to cast for one thing, and other than immunity to Fire, it really doesn't give you anything else. Or what I should say is that it doesn't give you anything else that's good. So I do think that when we want something like immunity to fire or poison, this is a good option. If we choose the upper planes, we get immunity to radiant and necrotic damage, and immunity to the charm condition. Immunity to the charm condition can be huge, and depending what we're fighting, immunity to radiant and necrotic can be huge as well. But the spell does more than that. We're also going to get Spectral Wings, giving us a fly speed of 40 feet. Not as good as the Fly spell, but we're getting other things here. We'll also get a plus 2 bonus to our armor class. That's good for any build at all, obviously. And then we're going to get two features that I think are basically useless. First one, all your weapon attacks are magical, and when you make a weapon attack, you can use your spellcasting ability modifier instead of strength or dexterity for the attack and damage rolls. And you can attack twice instead of once when you take the attack action on your turn. You ignore this benefit if you already have a feature like extra attack that lets you make more than one attack when you make your attack action on your turn. Now, I can understand you read those two things and you think, I can turn my wizard into a fighter. And you can't. Just be aware that if you are using weapons, you must have feats to accompany those weapons once you get into high levels if you want to be effective. At low levels, you can get away with it. But we're talking at least level 11 here. By this point, the fighter's got sharpshooter, the fighter's got crossbow expert. The fighter probably has a way to get advantage on those attacks. Extra attack and intelligence modifier for our longsword does not nearly enough to make that a worthwhile use of our action. We are likely doing more damage with our crappy cantrips. Now, you might think, but there are spellcasters that do go into melee. Wouldn't they take advantage of this? And I would say probably not. They either likely already have another ability score that's high enough that using the casting stat isn't a big advantage, or they already have their weapons based on their casting stat. And they probably already either have extra attack, or they're using Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade. So neither of these are very likely to give you anything on a caster that's already a melee caster. And if you're not a melee character that is a caster, then you're probably not getting enough from this to make it worthwhile. But that doesn't mean this spell is bad, because the first four abilities are all really good. The immunities, the wings, the armor class bonus, add all of those together, and you have a decent utility and defensive spell. Now, the use of concentration is a big drawback, but still, depending what you're fighting, 
being able to do this with a bonus action could be helpful. And immunity to those damage types might just give you immunity to the attacks. You got an Ancient Red Dragon coming up next on your turn. Being able to give yourself immunity to fire is massive. So I think overall this is still a purple rank spell, but I don't think this is the new Tensor's Transformation. And by the way, Tensor's Transformation is a bad spell, don't ever take it. Next spell is a 7th level spell, it's called Dream of the Blue Veil. And I'll just say right off the bat that this is for your DM to give you, it's not something for you to select. You cannot use this spell without your DM giving you something that you're not going to get in most campaigns which is a magic item or a willing creature from a world different than the one you're in. So if you're in Eberron, you could get a magic item from Middle-earth and then travel to Middle-earth. But your DM doesn't normally give you a magic item from Middle-earth if you're playing in Eberron. So like I said, if you're a player, don't even look at Dream of the Blue Veil. If you are a DM and your characters are in a certain setting and you think it would be interesting to put them in a different setting, then look at Dream of the Blue Veil throw it on a scroll, give it to your characters in addition to the material component for this spell, and you can take your campaign in a new direction. But I'm not even going to rank Dream of the Blue Veil because there's no point in me doing so, because again, as a player, this spell isn't for you. It is for your DM to give you. And when they give it to you, it's essential. And if they don't give it to you, it's pointless. And that brings us to our ninth level spell, which is Blade of Disaster. This is available to sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. It's a bonus action cast with concentration one minute. Now if you are giving me a one minute concentration spell with a ninth level spell, it better be damned amazing. You summon a blade, it is going to get two attacks around using your spellcasting modifier. That uses up your bonus action each round, and generally speaking, we're looking at 40-12 damage on a hit. Now it can move through any barriers, including a wall of force. And 40-12 damage, bonus action, concentration, must roll the hit for two attacks a turn, isn't worth a ninth level slot. It sounds good, but it's just, you got to think about the spells we're comparing this to at this level. This would be a fantastic eighth level spell. As a ninth level spell, ugh. That said, that doesn't mean I think this is a useless spell. There are certain builds, I think, that could take a lot of advantage of this, and that is crit fishing builds. I have already presented crit fishing builds on this channel. So if we think about it this way, so let's say we are making two attacks around with this, we have elven accuracy, this spell gives us an 18 or higher crit range, and every time we hit we do an additional 8d12 damage, so that's double what you would normally get from a crit. So we would expect to get probably a crit around. So then we're talking about the 4d12 from the one regular hit and then 12d12 from the second hit. Suddenly now we're talking about a good amount of damage. So for a crit fishing build, I could see Blade of Disaster being reasonably effective. For just my standard caster, if I wasn't planning for it beforehand, fishing for criticals isn't something I'm built for and I get to 17th level, I'm not taking Blade of Disaster for my ninth level spell when I am a sorcerer, warlock, or wizard. So I'm calling this orange because I do think there are builds that could take a lot of advantage over this. So between this video and my last video, I've now discussed all the new spells in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I'll be getting back into subclasses next week, and we're going to talk about monks. And were monks fixed in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything? I'll talk about that next time. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you next time.